it is Violetti now. Coming to you today to say hello and read from my book, Simple Abundance, a day book of comfort and joy. So let's start reading. Desire, ask, believe, receive. Difficult times have helped me to understand better than before how infinitely rich and beautiful life is in every way and that so many things that one goes worrying about are of no importance whatsoever. Isaac Dennison Are you a worrier? We all are to a certain extent, but some of us are more pessimistic than others. And when we worry, it's always the worst possible thing that comes first to mind. Worrying is a great, great thief of time. I have a good friend who can soar from distress to disaster in five seconds. Then it has caused her no end of sorrow. Now that she recognizes the pattern and can stop herself in mid-flight with a gentle reminder, she experiences much more inner harmony even under difficult circumstances. Often when we stew, we think that we're doing something positive about the problem. At least we're thinking about it. Instead, we've set off an escalating spiral that can ruin an entire day for ourselves and those in our vicinity. If you find yourself fretting over an issue, instead of working yourself into a frenzy, stop. Now think about everything that's humming along nicely. Can you have a conversation with spirit? If you don't feel comfortable calling your communion with a higher power prayer, call it a communication with a good friend. I learned that simply to ask a blessing upon one's circumstances, whatever they are, is somehow, somehow to improve them and to tap some mysterious source of energy and joy, writer Marjorie Holmes confides. I came upon one of the most ancient and universal truths, that to affirm and to claim God's help, even before it is given, is to receive it. Lift up your worries and ask for grace to get through the rest of the day. There is an abundance of amazing grace available to all of us if we simply learn to ask for it. Desire, ask, believe, receive, the mystic Stella Terrell man advises. Begin praying or conversing in that order and you'll understand why she does after praying about your worries is there a friend you can share your problem with if not sit down quietly and write out what's troubling you now write out the worst case scenario what are your greatest fears if that happened what would you do how would you cope once you have a solution beyond then I don't know response, write it down. One of the reasons we worry is because we feel powerless to control our futures. When we figure out what we do if the worst did happen, the sense of hopelessness diminishes. I have spent most of my life worrying about things that have never happened, Mark Twain admitted at the end of his life. We all do this. Worrying about the future robs you of the present moment. Try to observe how much worrying you do. And if the nagging worry follows you relentlessly throughout the day, follow Scarlett O'Hara's Scarlet example. Tell yourself, I'm not going to think about this right now. I'll think about this tomorrow. After all, tomorrow is another day. Joyful Simplicities for July. 
Make the pursuit of happiness real and personal. Hang and wave the flag. Find a local parade and then share loaves and fishes with family and friends at an old-fashioned potluck picnic. Watch the fireworks in the evening or set off your own authentic sparks. Declare your personal independence. Choose to live authentically as a dreamer, not an expector. If you have a beach sojourn this month, try to enjoy it at different times. An early morning browse to collect shells before the crowds come. A late afternoon visit to fly kites after they've left. Save one evening for a moonlight walk. If you're not alone, hold hands. Stand at the water's edge or sit on a towel to gaze out across the water. Just let the rhythm of the waves wash over you. Experience and savor the suspension of time. If you've not yet read Anne Morrow Lindbergh's Gift from the Sea, this is the perfect month to do so. Read with a yellow highlighter and mark the passages that speak to your soul. Date them in the margin. While at the shore, get a yard of fisherman's netting to a shell shop or five and dine. Hang it in a window or drape it over a tabletop and create a seashore vignette. Bring home a bottle of sand. Place the sand on a tray. If you're in a meditative mood, do your shell searching on the shore. However, the most exotically decorative seashells are usually to be found at shell shops, unless you do your beach combing at Fiji. Landlubbers can surf the web for netting at cascadenets.com. When was the last time you stargazed? One clear eve summer's evening, lie on a big blanket in your backyard with a good bottle of wine or sparkling cider, cheese, biscuits, and fresh fruit. Look up into the night sky. Realize that you've got a friend up there. Stargazing is one of the oldest human pastimes, and there's good reason for it. Gazing at the stars reminds us that there's more than we'll ever realize and that every day is another chance to follow the clues. Find a star to wish upon. During a summer th thunderstorm, sit in the middle of your bed in the dark and watch out the window or from a screened in porch. Experience the beauty and power of nature unleashed. Now think about harnessing that power in your life by asking for the light to be switched on. Whether you know the Bible or not, a marvelous way to rediscover it is through the eyes of other women. A wonderful collection of essays by women writers exploring their favorite Bible stories is Out of the Garden, Women Writers on the Bible, edited by Christina Bookman and Selena Spiegel. 28 great woman writers, including Cynthia Ozick, Ursula K. Le Guin, Patricia Hempel, Faye Weldon, and Louise Erdick, reflect thoughtfully, playfully, and provocatively on Old Testament stories, characters, and poetry that mean the most to them. To savor the experience, even more, munch on the biggest, reddest, and juiciest apple you can find while you read. As the editors observe, unlike the Garden of Eden, the Bible is a source women can return to, and as with all great works of literature, it is a book that changes as we change. For curiosity, we were thrown out of the garden, and with curiosity, we return. While waiting for the potatoes to boil, or lying in a hammock, dip into books with culinary themes, such as the romantic and bittersweet novel like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel or Jacqueline Derval's 
Reckless Appetite, a Culinary Romance. There's a continual feast of cooking mysteries simmering on library and bookstore shelves, especially fulfilling. Diane Mott Davidson's delicious series featuring a caterer turned sleuth in Catering to Nobody, Dying for Chocolate, and Serial Murders. Arranging a dinner around a film might seem old hat, but not if you pair the cuisine with the film. Enjoy Mexican enchiladas with chocolate mole sauce while watching the sensuous like water for chocolate. Order Chinese carryout to accompany the delectable eat, drink, man, woman. Make French cuisine de femme to counterpoint the sumptuous Babette's feast. Since all the passionate hungers are explored in these foreign films, they're definitely for viewing after the children are in bed. To make your cake baking meditation as inspirational as possible, you might want to take a look at The Cake Bible by Rose Levy Berenbaum with its over 200 suggestions for meditations you'll never forget. Remember, no matter what life throws at us, we can always bake a cake. Summer's Leaf has all too short a date. William Shakespeare. Aficionados of August revel in a relinquishment. When it's 100 degrees in the shade, it's too hot to be anything but receptive, receptive when reflective. Let a seasonally sanctioned, sanctioned sojourn of slow joys refill the authentic reservoir of creative energy. This month, month on the simple abundance path, we commit to rediscovering, acknowledging, appreciating, owning, and honoring our authentic gifts, transforming not only our own lives, but the lives of those we love. The harmonic convergence of, of, us, uh, convergence of an authentic life. But if you have nothing at all to create, then the perhaps you create yourself, Carl Jung. Do you remember what you were doing the weekend of August 16th and 17th, 1987? I don't. If you do, perhaps you were among the more than 144,000 people who journeyed to power points around the world, such as Egypt's Great Pyramids, Peru's Machu Picchu, Japan's Mount Fuji, the temples of Delphi in Greece, Mount Shasta, California, Sedona, Arizona, the Black Hills of South Dakota, and New York Central Park to hold hands, hum, and resonate in harmony in the New Age global event known as the Harmonic Convergence. What made this weekend so significant was a rare astronomical occurrence known as a grand trine when all nine planets were in their astrological fire signs and positioned exactly 123 degrees apart from each other. It had been 23,412 years since the last one. Now add an esoteric interpretation of ancient Mayan and Aztec calendars and a Hopi legend about a gathering of enlightened teachers meant to awaken humanity and it's not surprising that thousands of new agers decided that circumstances were as perfect as they'd ever be to direct the earth through meditation toward a peaceful spiritual awakening instead of a cataclysmic one in the next millennium. It seems to have worked. Each week, another visionary book is published, encouraging spiritual evolution as the road less traveled becomes this inspirational superhighway. But there are so many voices offering clues, glimmers, and insights on how to achieve harmony 
through the divine grand trine of mind, body, and spirit. How do you discern your own truth? And there are so many spiritual paths. Which one should you follow? Is undertaking a spiritual life? What matters is simple. American Buddhist master and teacher Jack Cornfield reassures us in his wonderful book, A Path with Heart, a guide through the perils and promises of spiritual life. We must make certain that our path is connected with our heart. When we ask, am I following a path with heart? We discover that no one can define for us exactly what our path should be. Instead, we must allow the mystery and beauty of this question to resonate within our being. Then somewhere within us an answer will come and understanding will arise. If we are still and listen deeply, even for a moment, we will know if we are following a path with heart. For me, bearing witness to my authentic self is the most joyous and fulfilling spiritual path I have ever followed. It is truly a path with heart. It began when I acknowledged that creativity is holy. Perhaps this August, you might like to convene a personal harmonic convergence through rediscovering, recovering, and celebrating your creativity, the sacred conduit to access your authentic self. It's never too late to reclaim your individual gifts, resuscitate a dream, create an authentic life. Consider this, what if original sin was denying instead of celebrating your originality? Each of us possesses an exquisite, extraordinary gift, the opportunity to give expression to divinity on earth through our everyday lives. When we choose to honor this priceless gift, we participate in the recreation of the world. When we follow our authentic path with love, embracing our creative impulses, we live truth, even if what we think we're doing is just planting a flower bed, cooking a meal, nurturing a child, editing a book, producing a television show, sewing a curtain, writing a brief, painting a picture, teaching a craft, composing a song, or closing a deal. As the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, monk poet, and writer Thich Nhat Han reminds us, our own life is the instrument with which we experiment with truth. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Bye.